We staan hier in Straatsburg en hier achter mij ziet u het Europees Hof voor de Rechten van de Mens. Daar dient op dit moment een zaak van zes Portugese kinderen die 33 landen hebben aangeklaagd vanwege klimaatfoltering. Dat is eigenlijk een urgendazaak tot de macht 100 en dat kan een hele grote impact hebben voor onze economie als deze kinderen in het gelijk worden gesteld. Deze zaak had hier helemaal niet mogen dienen omdat uh, dat had eerst op, op nationaal niveau een uitspraak uh, over moeten zijn en dat is helemaal niet gebeurd. De president van deze rechtbank heeft ook uh, gezegd het is urgent dus we gaan het direct behandelen en die heeft ook uh, het woord foltering toegevoegd aan, uh, aan de aanklacht. Dus die, dat, dat, dat belooft niet veel goeds voor de uitspraak. Of ik heb geprobeerd om als derde partij te interviewen, want deze zaak had hier helemaal niet mogen dienen. We hebben daar een goede argumentatie voor geschreven, maar die is zonder, uh, zonder duidelijke motivatie is die afgewezen. Inmiddels is het rapport klaar, 305 pagina's over wat hier allemaal mis is. Wij, uh, wij gaan uh, dit rapport opsturen, want ik heb het ook geprobeerd om het te overhandigen, maar de president wil mij niet ontvangen. Dus wij gaan dit opsturen en dit wordt vervolgd. So Lucas, thank you very much for uh, receiving us uh, over here. Um, you wrote a report about this six Portuguese uh, children who sued 33 countries. What is going on? Yes, th these 33, ch uh, sorry, these six children sued 33 countries before the European Court of Human Rights. And this is a, a court of law in Strasbourg, France, which has been set up to protect the human rights laid down in the European Convention on Fundamental Freedoms and Human Rights, to which some 47 European states are parties, including the 33 states that they are currently suing in this, uh, in this lawsuit. And their claim is that their right to life is at stake, is being violated by the governments of these 33 countries because they do not enact what these children believe to be adequate climate policy. And they claim that their future uh, is not guaranteed and that they may suffer severely from, from uh, extreme weather such as uh, heat as well as uh, drought. So that's the essence of their claim. Um, and when you ask the question somewhat differently, you sort of say, oh, how is it possible that somebody can launch a claim, a case like this before this court? How is this possible? Because this convention does not in any way address climate change. It's not about climate change at all. It's about human rights, freedom of expression and so on, freedom of religion. And what you see then is, is interesting. The, the European Court of Human Rights has decided that it wants to jump on the climate bandwagon. It wants to be part of the climate movement. And in order to become part of that movement, the court in 2020, last year, organized a conference with the title Human Rights for the Planet. Well, that's of course a nonsensical concept because human rights are not intended for the planet, they are for human beings. But they, they launched this conference, they did this big conference. One of the speakers at the conference was the president of the European Court, uh, Robert Spano, and the title of one of his three speeches, by the way, at this conference, the title of one of these three speeches was, should the European Court of Human Rights become the European Climate Change Court, thereby openly extending an invitation to climate activists to file complaints with the court and get the court to basically be in a position to invite the court to also jump on this uh, climate bandwagon and join the climate movement. And that is exactly what happened. Another judge um, on this court, uh, Judge Aiki, who is the vice president of the chamber that's currently considering the complaint by these uh, Portuguese children. Um, he gave a speech um, on, um, on, on human rights and climate change. And one of the comments that he made was basically to affirm his belief in, in the climate crisis, referring to David Attenborough, the biologist, the famous biologist who makes these beautiful documentaries, but who's not at all a climate scientist, is very much a climate activist, 
and, um, and, and very much alarmist. So he quotes from David Attenborough to sort of describe the state of the science. And one of the other things he did in his speech, which is very worrisome, is that he said no one can legitimately call into question the climate crisis, which basically means that the states that have been sued before the European um, Court can no longer make the argument that they do not believe that there is a climate crisis. Well, everybody knows that climate crisis is not a scientific concept. That's a concept that is used in politics to sort of show the, the commitment to, to Paris. But it's not at all a scientific concept, but it's being positioned like that uh, in this lawsuit. There have been a total of 24 instances that we have documented in the report. Um, uh, 24 instances where the European Court has clearly violated the rules that bind it. It has violated rules set forth in the Convention, rules set forth in the uh, rules of the Court, in other international law instruments, as well as a rule set forth in its own ethical code by making all sorts of decisions that clearly show partisanship, that show a commitment, an activist commitment to the climate movement, but are not at all consistent with, the, uh, with what the court should be doing, which is um, objective uh, lawmaking, applying the law as it, as it is laid down in the convention. To give you one example, in addition to the claims about human rights, the court, at its own volition, decided to also add to the charges against the 33 states torture, Article 3 of the Convention, a prohibition on torture. You shall not torture anybody. Well, to suggest that enacting inadequate policy amounts to torture is quite something. It means that politicians who support what the court believes to be inadequate climate policy would be actually torturing people that means they are guilty of a crime that can be prosecuted before the International Criminal Court. So this would be a very um, serious situation. By, the, by suggesting that this is a real possibility, the court is essentially threatening these politicians uh, with a potential criminal prosecution. Wow. But these are six Portuguese children, and the, youngst the, the youngest one is nine years old, I believe. Um, I have children myself, but when uh, they are grown up now, but when they were nine years old, um, they were playing outside. How come the, these children of, of, of nine years old, uh, and, and some a little older, but how come that they are busy with this case? Yes, that's of course a very, a very good question. Children of nine years old do not draft uh, complaints uh, as complex as the one that's filed by the, by, uh, with this court. And this indeed is a very complex uh, complaint. It totals something like almost 1,200 pages of text. So it's a huge document that they filed with all sorts of evidence. And of course, there's a whole network of people supporting this case behind these children. The children are just being used as as a, um, a tool to get access to the court. And the reason why they use children is because they essentially want to make the argument that children are particularly affected by climate change because they still have a long life to live and therefore they will have to suffer through all this horror that's still to come our way. That's sort of the suggestion that they're making. But if you look at the organization behind it, it's a very professional organization made up of NGOs um, that support human rights and they support uh, climate action, so climate activists. And uh, they have uh, put a lot of resources behind it and they get support from, from various other organizations, including, for instance, the University of Amsterdam, who has been doing the research for them on human rights issues. So they put all this stuff together and then later on in the process, you do see that other human rights and climate organizations step in as well they also file a request with the court to be admitted to the procedure as a third party intervener. And by virtue of that, they get the right to be heard by the court. They get the right to speak before the court as well as to file a brief with the court, a document um, that they can file, which lays out their opinions on, on the case. And a total of some eight of these NGOs have been admitted to the case 
Uh, they've all now filed their briefs, and of course they all support these Portuguese children from various angles. Very well done, it's very uh, well orchestrated, it's, it's, it's a good campaign from, from that perspective. But at the same time, you do see that the court has rejected applications uh, for third-party intervention from uh, other organizations. And uh, I know that you have supported one of those groups. You, you were uh, a spokesman for one of them uh, who wanted to argue um, the case before the court from a political perspective to sort of um, provide that input to the court. Um, you had drafted a, an application that was very detailed with uh, lots of sound arguments um, and the court rejected your application basically in one sentence saying that uh, it wasn't necessary. Um, thumbs down. There were two other organizations that have been rejected. Um, one wanted to provide scientific input. Uh, currently there is no scientific input provided to the court. This organization wanted to educate the court on, on the science, on climate science, what is known, what is not known, where's the uncertainties and so on. They too have been rejected, one sentence, thumbs down. And there was a further organization, um, uh, the rule of law proponents, who intended to provide input from the perspective of, of, of law and how you should look at these issues from, in particular, the rule of law perspective. That organization was also rejected by the court. Same reasoning, we don't need you, thumbs down. So, as you can see, the court is already uh, acting uh, in a rather partisan way and clearly setting itself up to give a, um, a ruling that, that may well turn out to be um, uh, supportive of, of at least some of the things that these children are claiming. In the rule of law. We had the, uh, kind of similar cases in the Netherlands uh, with the agenda uh, case and also with uh, Royal Dutch. Um, what does this mean for the rule of law? Yeah, that's a great question. The rule of law, of course, is a rather elusive concept because, um, you know, in German it's called Rechtsstaat, in, in Netherlands we call it uh, Rechtsstaat. It, it, it basically means that all branches of government are bound by the law, so nobody is above the law. The, not the president, not the parliament, not the courts either. But what we do see now is that because the courts have the power to interpret the law, they also get to interpret what the rule of law means and what separation of powers means. And they have the final say on these issues. So if there is a, a, a European Court of Human Rights, they get to determine how the rule of law applies to themselves. And what we see here is that um, they don't feel at all bound by the rule of law they feel only bound by their own opinions on what that rule of law requires. And their opinion on what the rule of law requires over the years has moved incredibly far away from what the rule of law actually requires. So they now confuse their own opinions of the rule of law and of separation of powers with the actual rule of law, which creates enormous risks for the way that democracy operates. The, democracy, um, of course, is a system where, to a large extent, uh, parliaments get to make the laws, get to decide uh, what are the appropriate rules for the people to be governed by. And they are accountable to the people. Judges are not accountable. But these judges now sort of have assumed, have taken over the role of parliaments and start to enact laws that bind people uh, directly and without any ability to appeal, without any ability to go anywhere. Um, so that is threatening because we now face situations where unaccountable judges that are not really very competent either on scientific matters, that do not understand really in detail the, all the dynamics of politics and so on, they make decisions that people will have to live by for decades to come and that's a, a frightening prospect I would say. What, what is going on and, and what is your opinion, what should be, uh, what should be the case? Yes, um, w what is going on right now is that so far the court has shown, I would say, partisanship in the way it has dealt with this complaint. There were many reasons as to why the court should not have taken this case and should have rejected it outright. They didn't do it, but not only that, they accepted the case, they didn't, uh, they didn't reject it. They accepted it, although it's clearly inadmissible. 
But then they also turned around and declared it urgent. So they now apply a fast track proceeding. Well, to call climate change something that's really urgent is of course rather a stretch. Climate change is not something that kills people tomorrow. If it does, if it has any effect, to the extent there's effects, it's a decade long process. It's not, it's not a matter of, of, of days, weeks or months. But the court treats it as an urgent case. It's, um, it has added torture to the, to the allegations against the states. It has, um, it has admitted the, all these NGOs, these activist NGOs, rejected uh, people that, that are um, uh, more critical of the case and provide different perspectives. It has done so many things that show clear partisanship. And you sort of wonder what that does to the court. Is, I mean, this court will lose a lot of credibility and its own legitimacy if it's not careful. It already, of course, has been criticized for extending the law way beyond where it should be in other cases. But if it proceeds along the lines that it currently has set out for itself, the whole system, I think, will be in jeopardy. So hopefully the court will realize that it's, uh, it's time to, to really turn around and, and not become climate activists, but rather apply the convention as it has been drafted and agreed by, by the government. Um. The European Court of Human Rights, is, that is the end station of, of our law in, in, um, in, in the European Union, in, the, in Europe. Uh, is there something that, that people can do if they disagree with this judgment? The European Court of Human Rights is supposed to be the ultimate arbiter on questions around human rights. So. Before you get to go and file a complaint with the European Court, you first have to exhaust all national proceedings. It means you have to first apply at the first level in your own member state, then appeals, then final, you know, before the Supreme Court of your own member state. And only once you have exhausted all of these legal processes, only then can you appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. In this uh, Portuguese uh, case, climate case, the children didn't do that at all. They went straight to the European Court of Human Rights, which is very exceptional, and only on that ground the case should have been rejected. But once you have a decision of the European Court of Human Rights, there's nothing you can do. They are the final say, they have the final say, they are the word, the final word about human rights in Europe. Which means that the more they extend human rights, the more space they occupy through human rights, and the more power they have, and all that power is then taken away from the dem democratically elected uh, politicians who no longer have a right to rule within the scope of this protected sphere protected by human rights. And this is what people refer to as human rightization. Everything is turned into human rights, and therefore the scope of judicial power increases to the detriment of the scope of democratic institutions. It's very clear. It's um, as a politician, it's uh, it, it worries me a lot because um, uh, for me the democracy is is uh, the most important thing in our lives. Um, I want to thank you very much for this uh, clear explanation. We will follow this case, and um, I'm sure we we come back to you uh, if there is, uh, is is new information. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was my pleasure.